Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Richard Sachs. I'm Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at University of Rio Grande and Rio Grande Community College, located in Rio Grande, Ohio, in beautiful Gallia County. Uh, I'm delighted to have as my guest today Kingsley Meyer, who is the Director of Campus Computing and Networking. Uh, Kingsley's been at Rio Grande for over two decades now. And um, I always say that Kingsley is one of the reasons or maybe one of the excuses why I came to Rio Grande because he and Ray Mature were the first two people I met when I came here. And I was very impressed with both. And, and Kingsley's been a great source of support, not just for me, but for the entire academic curriculum. And I will say this, when I asked Kingsley to be on my show, I'm embarrassed to say I did not know he had his own show and he was still willing to come on. So I think this is kind of like Dick Cavett agreeing to be on Johnny Carson or you know, update it to any of the current people. But we're delighted to have Kingsley here to talk about uh, academic computing. And the first thing I'd like to talk about is the history of academic com computing. And I have to uh, come clean with this and say, uh, in 1983, I was a doctoral student in Ann Arbor and the doctoral English uh, purchased a Commodore 64 computer, and we all were told to buy five-inch floppy disks. And believe it or not, we were scheduled for one-hour sessions, and you'd go behind the desk where the TAs had their offices into a closet, which I still remember was very dark and very cool. Um, and you'd sit there with your Commodore 64, and then as you got close to the end of your hour, the next person, the next doctoral student would be there, and you were told you had to get off. I then moved on. A year or two later, I bought a leading edge computer. You may remember those. They were IBM <coughs> copies, and I was told that they were cheaper and just as good. The leading edge. Uh, leading edge. What did I call it? No, I called it bleeding edge. Oh, bleeding edge. Okay. Bleeding edge. Bleeding edge technology. Okay, so, um, and that leading edge computer is what I wrote the rest of my dissertation on. I wrote the first couple chapters on one of those typewriters with the, with the cartridges, you know, you take in and out. And then uh, chapters three through six were on that leading edge computer. So, so that's how old I am in terms of computing. And I've always used computing as a support. I'm certainly not a high tech person, but I know you've been at Rio Grande for about a quarter of a century now. Um, Boy, you sure have a way with words. Right? Okay. <laughs> Um, academic computing and like my history in computing, I'll just kind of wrap these up quick. Um, when I went to college, we didn't even have uh, calculators. So what happened to us was, you know, we did everything with slide rules. I remember. Uh, but uh, my high school had an Olivetti. It was a computer. Uh, a couple of the math professors decided that they would go ahead and program it so that we would have alternating classrooms and we wouldn't have the same instructor or homerooms. Um, of course, they're sending people to the moon with slide rules and doing work like that at the time. But uh, um, I made it through college with just one computer class on a teletype hooked up to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Wow. And, uh, you know, that was on a, a punch paper tape on a roll. Pretty scary. Um, but when I came to Rio Grande, we had an AS400 system that was a uh, mini computer, if you want to call it that. And we had heavy-duty twin axe cables strung between the buildings, and they were using this for all of our academic and business computing needs. Uh, and when we did open registration, everybody gave up their terminals, they hauled them all across campus and reset them up in another building. Um, long time has uh, passed since then. Um, the internet itself uh, was around about the time when I came to Rio Grande uh, in the late 80s. But uh, something occurred when the Davis Library was invited to participate in the state of Ohio library system called OhioLink. And uh, in order to connect to OhioLink, each of the participating schools like Rio Grande Community College were allowed to write an NSF grant. And we connected to the state of Ohio with a twisted pair telephone line. And our library went online and uh, we hooked up a, a simple email system upstairs in the library and uh, help me 208 may have been the room and people went up there to check their mail but uh, wow. a lot's happened since then uh, the internet itself has grown into more locations uh, fortunately for Rio Grande um, we grew from one line to four lines, and then finally fiber optics uh, came through the village, and we were able to connect to the internet uh, 
to ORNET in Columbus, Ohio, the State of Ohio Academic Research Network. And at that time, we uh, then had a fiber connection that connected us all the way to uh, that, uh, that main hub in Columbus. The neat thing that happened is as we grew on campus and we fibered more buildings and we put, instead of terminals in offices, we put PCs. The state network and the national, national network grew and became more, more robust. Um, it was really devastating if a uh, squirrel was shot off a line or uh, somebody hit a, a utility pole and that network went down. Uh, today it's unthinkable. So networks themselves have become redundant, that there's multiple paths, and Rio Grande has uh, two lines. We have two internet service providers. We have multiple fiber connections coming in and out of campus. So it's very unlikely that our network will go down. And we've taken care to uh, put on our campus uh, generators in the key buildings so that we keep all those systems up and running. It's, uh, it's a combination of things that, that, that we do here and things that are out there on the internet right now that keep us all running. But it's gotten bigger and faster. Right. Well, before we leave this area, I'd like you to talk briefly about possible missteps and new advances in technology. And as you were talking, I was thinking about being a high school student in the 1970s with my best friend Rob Lash and telling Rob, I'm going to go, and so, because we both had reel-to-reel -reel cassettes. We had Hitachi cassettes um, and uh, that were real to, or, or Hitachi tape recorders. And I said to Rob, I'm going with cassettes. And he goes, you're crazy. I'm going with eight tracks. And I still have some of those cassettes from the 1970s, and I actually still have some equipment that can play them. Rob gave up, up his 8-tracks a long time ago, and of course cassettes have been superseded by other technologies now. But that was one time I made the right choice. Um, I also recalled, as you were talking, in the early 1990s, I was living in Gross Point, Michigan, and with my older kids in the public school system there, I served on a high school of the future committee where we recommended that at Gross Point High School, which was a beautiful 1918 Georgian colonial high school with all this plaster and lathe and everything, we said we have to have T1 lines. And so they tore through, it was a million dollar, millions of dollar project. They tore through, knocked out all this plaster. They ran all these T1 lines through. And within a few years later, I was moved to Colorado and everything was wireless. So I have no idea what they are doing in Gross Point Public Schools now. But obviously, we were trying to be cutting edge in 1992 or 93. And a decade later, everything's wireless. And we, we went to all those uh, uh, expenses for, for no reason. Um, we seem to still be in a wireless um, environment. Well, I think it's a, a mixture of, of different kinds of delivery modes. Uh, there's really nothing more secure or faster than a fiber optic sending pulses of lights down through those lines. And that's how the world's connected. Um, you can connect with uh, satellite, connect from tower to tower and hook up um, you know, buildings that are not accessible by fiber or copper. But still, fiber is your first choice. And here on our campus, we have fiber to each building. And then within the buildings, we have a mixture of both copper wires and uh, you know, the wireless. Wireless is very convenient, special for uh, mobile computing. I sure. wouldn't ever give up that opportunity. But it is only so fast. It's only so secure. And, and in some cases, there's only so many you know, wireless bands that you can broadcast at the same time. And so in buildings that have high density, engineers need to do radio studies. They need to be able to say, how far will this particular access point be able to broadcast in that building? What's the construction of the walls? Are they sure. going to bounce around? And then how many people are going to connect to that access point? Can it go inside an office suite, or do I have to put an access point in every single room? After a while, you still have wires, right. and those wires go back to the center core of the network. So there's no such thing as all wireless. Okay. Well, that's interesting because um, the two problems that I had when I was part of the University of New Mexico system I don't have here. 
first of all, when I was there, I had a laptop that was totally wireless, but if I wanted to print, I had to hook it in. Now, I know ever since I've been here, my laptop just automatically prints wirelessly to my printer. You've been spoiled. Oh, is that it? Okay. <laughs> um, but at UNM, my desktop was wired, and I know when I had problems with the wireless saying things are taking so long, my IT director there said, use the desktop because it's hardwired, and he did say it's more secure and it's faster. So is that still always true, that a hard wire is faster and more secure? Generally, yes. I'll, I'll just go ahead and say, uh, yes, it, it is better that way. Um, I'm going to throw a hats off to the, the folks on our campus computing and networking team, because uh, Mike and Alan and Mary support all of this. And it's taken a lot of work with our engineers and, and vendors to make sure that our system is designed to be able to pull off that combination that uh, for you being able to be on wireless and still appear as though you're in the wired network subnet so that you can see your printer. So when you log in, our wireless network knows your laptop, knows that you are logged in and moves you off into a special type of connection so that you're not on the public bring your own device wireless you are in our administrative Rionet network because your work needs to be protected. And so we do that for admissions, we do that for financial aid, we do that for anybody that has a mobile laptop that is belonged, you know, owned by the University of Rio Grande. Okay, and I've noticed too that um, within the UNM system, there were high usage times. It was the only, I was at a branch campus, it was the only campus I've ever been on with no dorms whatsoever. So there was nobody there overnight. And every morning, um, mo you know, Monday through Thursday morning, beginning at 7.30, the place was packed. And come mid-morning, I would often be bumped off the network or things would be really slow. And when I talked to my IT director, he'd say, well, the students come in, it's poor New Mexico, a lot of them don't have internet at home. So as soon as they come in, whether or not they have class, they immediately go on the internet here. If you miss that, we, we, we can we, do that for you. Oh, okay, no, I don't miss it at all. I think it's great, um, but I, I mean, I know how we try to do $20 worth of work for $7 here, and we seem to keep doing it well, but I have not noticed in 14 months that there are high usage times when I have lesser connectivity or, or quickness. Ryle Grand's very fortunate for uh, a couple of different uh, factors. First of all, when we built the fiber network, we built it so that it could be high capacity then and in the future. Um, we went over 10 years before we replaced our network equipment, and it is a tenfold factor, fa factor faster than it was. And then we bought wireless equipment, and then we replaced it with newer equipment. So it's all as, as good a technology as you can get. Um, but you know, the thing is that it all has to go out to the internet somehow. And we do have, as I started at the top, two internet service providers. And in general, we have all of the academic and administrative computing on one network. We have all the wireless on the other. So those people that are connecting with their tablets and you know, their, their game stations and everything else, they're going off on one network, we're going off on the other. We're, we're fortunate in the fact that we do have multiple internet service providers in uh, this village and that we do have multiple paths. We're also fortunate that uh, in the time of doing more with less and budget cuts, the cost of internet connectivity is dropping and this year we <coughs> renegotiated a contract and we went from 100 megs of network connectivity to a gig of network connectivity at no cost increase. So again, a tenfold increase in capacity and speed, and that's why you don't stutter. Wow. If, if you would like your Netflix and other things to, <laughs> you know, to go and... Uh, and the circle just sure. going around and around. And you're but just you know, people that are, that are on uh, uh, fixed wireless networks at home, uh, people that are, are in a, a more restricted environment will notice that they're sharing it with others. And there will be a time that Rio Grande may see that type of uh, problem. Folks that are on uh, a satellite system at home typically fight 
two other issues. One's latency, going all the way up to space and back down so that there's a time delay. And then there's only so much you can push through a satellite for so many people and customers. And so they limit how much you can do. There's less limit on terrestrial systems. So you will see that if you can get fiber to your home, that's best. You know, copper lines are probably second, fixed wireless between you and a tower, maybe third. Okay. Um, let's move on and talk a little bit more about teaching with technology. I know one thing I was surprised at when I came here was even though anywhere between 5 and 12 percent of our classes are online or blended each term, that all the other professors teaching face-to-face, -face, as I generally do when I get in to teach my one class per year, they weren't using the blackboard shells we had available to them. And I know now with Randy Simpson creating automatic shells for every class, I'm going to really push the faculty this fall. Even if you're just teaching face-to-face, -face, use that blackboard shell. I mean, it helped me simply in terms of saying, here's your four-page syllabus, you need it again, go to the Blackboard site. And every time I said, oh, here's the intro to poetry handout sheet, here's the intro to American Indian Lit handout sheet, you want a second sheet, it's on our Blackboard site. So if only that, if they had like left the sheet or left the syllabus somewhere else, they could always go and check it. So that alone, I think, is a strong reason. You've mentioned how many faculty, and I know from visiting their classes, are using streaming video and things like that. Richard, if you lived in a, in a community of um, more elderly people, you might like to have a local market where people know your name. But if your customers change, the markets need to change as well. And for Rio Grande, our students are looking to digital. Their first de device is typically a, a phone. And in our last orientations, 100% of the people that came through had phones. Really? Maybe the batteries were down and it was in the car, yeah. but they're all a very wired group. So they're looking for content that is much like what they get on their mobile device. If we teach old school, we're not going to be communicating with our customers. So we do need to raise the bar for our faculty to start using some of our tools. And a little bit later on, I want to show some of the collaborative environments that we have that uh, use Office 365. Okay. But Blackboard in particular is a great way of putting your syllabus, putting your content material out there and being able to have that drop box for your assignments so that students can go ahead and not only read their assignments, grab their content, but they can also go back out there and have assessments online, have those grades recorded, have a place to drop their papers. And it changes everything. Um, I'm not sure how many people are going to be turning in papers and seeing red markers, you know, this year, but hopefully that will uh, decrease over time. Good. Um, there's always a difficult cost-benefit scenario as an administrator because if I start a new program or open a new section, we're going to get a little bit more tuition revenue. But if I upgrade a person's computer, they'll probably feel less frustrated but it's hard for me to argue to a CFO, see how much more money this brought in. I, re I reduce the instructor angst. That person can more effectively do the professional things we need for them to do. Um, I, I guess this is like one of those questions at a debate when the candidate says, okay, where's the question there? But I guess that's a continuing concern mm -hmm. that I have is to justify the utilization of more technology, especially things like having a standard refresh um, in New Mexico, we had a four-year refresh. In Colorado, we had a three-year refresh. And my, uh, my high-touch technology people, like my filmmaker in the English department, he would trade with other people so they'd have a three- or four- or five-year refresh so that he could be upgraded every year. Um, what are we doing and what can we do to try to make certain that we're using 21st century technology as we graduate students into a 21st century world. All the equipment that we're running right now on campus is uh, current with Windows 7, which is the um, most frequent operating system right now, and they're running uh, four gigs of memory. They have uh, gig connections out to the network. They're operating pretty well. But as you know, we have some uh, systems on campus that are almost 10 years old. And one of the CFOs had asked me one time when I was requesting a refresh, he said, are you telling me that all the computers that we have right now 
aren't worth anything, that they have no utility. And that's kind of a misnomer. Everything has utility, but how long do you want to wait? And if you are cranking through video and doing other projects that are more intensive, do you have the horsepower to create that output in a, time, in a good time frame? Um, we are planning this year to upgrade the existing computers by doubling the memory so that they don't have to struggle so hard. They're not processor intensive activities, but this will greatly help them. And we're going to take some of the drives out and for the people that really need the horsepower, put in a solid state drive. Hmm. A cost benefit ratio is hard to calculate as is a, uh, you know, the uh, re return on investment. Um, everybody would love to have a new computer, but to be honest, um, my personal laptop is about five years old. It works just fine. When I have to write the check or to pay for that credit card, I really couldn't justify buying a new one. I, I did buy a tablet. It's, you know, three or four years old. Um, so it, it, it's sort of a relative way that you, you want to go with that. Okay. And I know you said you were bringing in an Intel Nook today for show and tell. Sure. And that is not spelled N-O-O-K, but capital N, N, capital U, capital C, which sure looks a lot like an acrim, acronym. We've been excited to, uh, to, to work on these. Um, in our office, we have people that uh, have used these before. Um, I have one at home. And this actually is a computer that is an Intel 5 core processor. It has all of the connectors on the outside for hooking up your keyboard and your mouse. It has wireless, it has Bluetooth. This will be the fastest desktop computer on campus. Wow. And the community college is going out and putting some at the Meg Center. And as soon as they arrive, we're going to get them all ready and move them up. Um, what's exciting about them is that our keyboards and mice and our monitors are still good. Why would you get rid of something that still has utility? So we're going to go ahead and replace the old CPU with something like that. And uh, we're, we're very excited about it. That's great. That's great. That's very, <coughs> that is indeed very exciting. Um, there's so many more questions that I have to ask you, but I know we're down to our last seven or eight minutes now, and, um, or five and a half minutes. Um, so can you talk about future developments and possibilities in academic okay. computing? Where, where sure. are we going? Um, there was a time when uh, libraries were assessed during accreditation visits by how many you know, volumes were in volumes? the library. Absolutely. And, and today, I think we're looking at different models for your instructional capacity and the support systems. At, at least our accreditation visits are you know, asking other questions. Um, today, not only do we have good internet, but we're working on uh, using some of the applications that have been made available to us by companies like Alphabet, the old Google, and uh, yes, Microsoft. Um, so I'm going to ask Mike to, to pop up some slides for us. Um, we are a Microsoft Office campus, and every student that comes in for orientation uh, immediately gets an Office 365 app. Um, most people are familiar with mail, calendars, and address books, but what we have in our Office 365 accounts is an online version of Word, Excel, and PowerPoint, OneNote, they have a video library, and all of this stuff that they produce using a web browser can go into the one cloud. It's an unlimited storage area. Old school, you print a paper, you turn it in. New school, you print it, you do it electronically, and then you save it in OneDrive and send your professor a link. The nice thing about it is, on the next slide, we uh, do have this available in mobile versions. So it's on iPad and Android, and all of this is wireless. It looks the same for email. We have our email accounts, and it shows calendars, contacts, address books, and then we have a place for OneDrive not only in the mobile environment, but also in your browser. So this is where we're going to be saving stuff. And today's students that were here for the College Credit Plus, they just moved right through this very, very quickly. Now, the Word is a web-based copy of the browsing you know, version of Word. 
you know, too many people say, can I do this on my phone? We go, no, get a real keyboard. You really don't want to type on the, on the phone. But the nice thing about it is this will be available anywhere in the world and we can keep your academic portfolio and, until the next time you need it. And you have recent files on there too. I thought we couldn't do that. <laughs> well. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to get No, no, get in, that, in, in yeah. that version you can. Okay. In that version you can. Okay. Um, this is a, a new app that just showed up last week. Every time we look at Office 365, we see new things. This is called Sway. Um, the best way I could describe it, it's PowerPoint on steroids. <laughs> you can uh, go to the tutorials in the upper right, or you can look at some of the examples. And what you have is you have multimedia shows that look like blog pages, but the slides go one after the other. And you can really do some pretty stunning uh, you know, presentations with this. I can't wait for the first student to turn in an assignment in Sway and then stump their professor because the, the professor hasn't got that far yet. Yeah. So I think you know, it's a whole different world. You know, we're dealing with our students you know, that are digital media savvy. They're mobile savvy. And we do need to make sure that we provide the professional development for our faculty so that they understand the way our students are wanting to prepare the output for their assignments. I think it's kind of a, uh, I mean, the nice thing about our job, you know, in, uh, in, in technology is we get to see all these new things. And so it's always stimulating to find out what's coming next. Yeah. Well, we're entering toward our last minute now. Um, for students coming to Rio Grande for the first time this fall, and we will be starting classes within two weeks, um, it seems like students are all over the place. Some have a brand new, um, a brand new laptop. Some people are using a 10-year-old hand-me-down desktop. Some students come without computing. What would be the ideal um, electronics for a student to come to Rio Grande, and what can they expect once they get here, realizing we're in our last minute and you can't give a full answer? I know it's a, it's a horrible answer, but I always tell people, Rio Grande has everything they need in our labs and on campus, but if they want something for themselves, get what they can afford. Get what they can feel comfortable with. If they're prone to breakage, consider the warranties. Uh, but literally today, any device that you go out and buy that has a wireless card to it or that, uh, that, that you know, can you know, run a Windows application or a Mac, you know, Mac operating system is ready to go. Today's systems are compatible with all those operating systems. Right. Um, we have people that have arrived and uh, they just are bringing whatever they have. Great. Kingsley, it's been a fascinating conversation. The half hour has gone so quickly. Thank you so much. Um, goodbye from Rio Grande, Ohio today. My guest has been Kingsley Meyer, Director of CCNN.